Hello. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this message today. My prayer is that God will speak to you through this message, that you will hear something that will help you grow as a Christian. You will hear something that will help you mature as a follower of Jesus Christ. If I can answer any of your questions, please email me. My email address is really simple. It's pepper at fbcmv.com. And again, thanks for taking the time to watch today. My prayer is God will use it in your life. Now, enjoy the message. Take your copy of God's Word and find Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through verse 50 will serve as our text this morning. I am beginning today a new series of sermons that I'm calling The Other Suppers. Now let me explain that. We will be here in Luke's Gospel through Easter. Easter Sunday morning we'll preach the resurrection story from Luke's Gospel. On the Sunday before Easter, March the 24th, Easter's early this year, being the 31st of March. But on March the 24th, the Sunday before Easter, we will observe the Lord's Supper. And we will preach from Luke's account of the Lord's Supper. But from now until March the 24th, We're going to preach on the other suppers. Because you see, Luke's gospel gives us more accounts of Jesus eating than any other gospel. And so we're just going to look at four examples of Jesus eating with people and see if we can learn anything. From having Jesus over for dinner. And so we begin today with one of those other suppers. And it's found in Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. Let me read. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to come dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet And anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. He said to himself. Not out loud notice. He said to himself. If this man were a prophet. He would know who. And what sort of person. This woman is. Who is touching him. That she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him. Don't you ever think for one minute that Jesus doesn't know your thoughts. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they were unable to pay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, notice, turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, 
but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this very reason I say to you, her sins which are many have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus, that's he, then Jesus said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who are reclining at the table with him begin to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sin? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's pray. And with your head bowed and eyes closed, I ask you this question. Where are you in this story? Where are you in this story? Now pray for yourself that the Lord will reveal to you where you are in this story. And then pray for me. Pray for me that I can speak His truth today clearly. Pray for one another. Heavenly Father, thank you today for the opportunity to sing praises to you. To worship your Father. And now your word, we open it. And we seek an understanding. But beyond that, Father, we seek application to our own life. Let everyone here see, Father, where they are in this story. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak through me and to us all today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I've just read this account of Jesus, a Pharisee, and a woman. Now, I want to go back through it and I want to expand on it. I want to explain it because most of us here today are not first century Jews. <laughs> and so there are some things I need to fill in. There are some things I need to show you that will help you understand exactly what is going on here. All with the intent of you finding yourself in this story. Verse 36, Luke chapter 7. A Pharisee named Simon invites Jesus to dinner. The word Pharisee means separated ones. The Pharisees came into existence between Malachi and Matthew. 400 years of Jewish history. By the time your Old Testament closes with the last verse of Malachi and your New Testament opens with the first book of Matthew. There's 400 years of Jewish history. You don't find Pharisees in the Old Testament. And yet when you open the New Testament, you find Pharisees. Let me tell you who they are. They are, again, the word means separated one. And they came into being because they looked at their culture. They looked at society and they saw idolatry. They saw immorality. They saw godlessness and worship of false gods all around them. And so they separated themselves from it all in an effort... To hold on to the Jewish traditions and worship the true God. But by Jesus' day, they had reduced religion to externals, to rituals, to creeds. Not a good thing. They were smug, complacent, self-righteous. Not a good thing. They were also hostile to Jesus. I, I use the word hostile. It's probably pronounced hostile, isn't it? My dad was a football coach, and he used to say, there are three kinds of players that you need on your defense. Mobile, agile, and hostile. <laughs> and, so, and so these Pharisees are hostile to Jesus. They saw him as a lawbreaker. Take a few minutes with me and turn back a page or two to Luke chapter 5 and verse 30. 
Luke chapter 5 and verse 30. The Pharisees and their scribes begin grumbling at his disciples. That's Jesus' disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? He's breaking the law. He's eating with tax collectors and sinners. Look at verse 33. And they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and other prayers, offer prayers. But the disciples of the Pharisees also do the same. But yours eat and drink. In other words, Jesus, your disciples break the law. They don't fast and pray at all the times that we do. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Now it happened when he was passing through the grain fields on a Sabbath and his disciples were picking the heads of grain and rubbing them in their hands and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? You're you're gathering, you're you're harvesting, and that's not lawful. Look down at chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And there was a man there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. Jesus, you can't heal anybody on the Sabbath. That's work. And you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. So what I'm trying to tell you is that Jesus and the Pharisees didn't exactly exchange Christmas cards. In fact, in fact, every time a Pharisee is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, it is in hostility To Jesus. And Simon belonged to the Pharisees. Perfectly satisfied with himself. Observing all the traditions and ceremonies of the Pharisees. Why would Simon invite Jesus into his home? We're not told specifically in Scripture the motive behind Simon's invitation. But let's make an educated guess. Who is this guy who keeps breaking our laws? Maybe there was a genuine interest in Simon's heart. Who is this guy who doesn't seem to want to obey Anything like we obey. Or maybe Simon is trying to find a basis for a charge against Jesus. Maybe he wanted to entice Jesus into some further action that could be used against him. And oh, he found it. They found it. Talk about that more in just a moment. Why did Jesus go to Simon's house? To open Simon's blind eyes and lead him into the light. The text tells us that Jesus is reclining at Simon's table. Now that's not like your kitchen table. That's not like the table that you have to set when all the kids and the grandkids are coming. You know, that big long one and everybody sits around the table and grandpa sits at the end of the table and everybody holds hands and they say grace and it's just a wonderful time. No, this table is about 12 inches high off the ground. That's all it is, 12 inches high. And men would lean on their left elbow, prop themselves up, They would eat with their right hand and then their feet would be stretched out behind them having their sandals removed when they came into the door. Now don't ask me what you did if you were left-handed, okay? I mean, if you were left-handed, had to prop up on your right elbow and eat, you just threw the whole system off. I mean, you just... You just threw the whole system out of whack, okay? 
But that's how you ate. It's a 12-inch high table. They're propped up on their left elbow. They're eating with their right hand. Their feet are out behind them. And they're barefooted because their sandals have been taken off when they came into the room. And in this city, a well-known woman with a bad reputation comes in. A prostitute? Maybe so. Maybe no. We're not told specifically. But whatever her sin was, it was public and it was widely known. Now, let me help you. This is not Mary Magdalene. If you look at Luke 8, the very next verse or two, you see this woman, Mary Magdalene, Mary who was called the Magdalene, who seven demons had gone out. This is not Mary Magdalene. It's also not Mary who we see in John chapter 12. And let me read you that account. The account are two separate accounts. This one occurs in a a Pharisee's house. The other one occurs in Mary's house outside of Bethany. It says there, she made them supper there and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. This is John chapter 12 in verse 3. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. And Judas Iscariot said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? That is a separate account. It's not the same Mary. This woman, we do not know her name, We don't know her specific sin, but again, it is public and it's widely known who she is. Now, here's the crazy thing. It's not unusual for uninvited guests to come to dinner. How how would you like that, ladies? You, you, You invite somebody to dinner and a crowd shows up. Because that was not unusual. It was not unusual for uninvited guests to come to dinner. Not to eat, but just to listen. And so they would stand outside and lean in the windows. Or they would seat themselves along the wall, not along the table, propped up on the elbow, eating with your right hand. No, they would sit themselves along the wall and they came just to listen To possibly some pearl of wisdom that might be dropped from the lips of this invited guest. The guest of honor whose name is Jesus. So in comes this woman. Weeping. She's heard Jesus teach before. She's heard Jesus preach before. She's heard him say how your sins can be forgiven. Your sins can be lifted off of you. Your sins can be gone. Your sins can be blotted out. And she has believed. She has believed in Jesus. She has placed her faith in Jesus to do that for her. And so she comes with tears and an alabaster vase of perfume. To show her thanks. That alabaster vase would be white in color. It would be a long necked vase. And to pour out the contents. You would have to break the neck of the vase. And then pour it out. At first she is standing and weeping. Martin Luther in his commentary calls it heart water. Love that. First it was standing and weeping. Her heart watered. Then it's kneeling and wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. She stoops down and begins to do what no woman was supposed to do in public. She loosens her hair and lets it fall down. On the wedding day of a Jewish girl, she would bind up her hair And never again would she appear in public with it unbound. In the eyes of those 
seated there that day. This was a shameful situation. This was an indecent act. This was a disgraceful display. She didn't care. She didn't care what others thought. She loved Jesus. And so she started kissing Jesus' feet and pouring that vase of perfume over them. Intense love, supreme devotion, complete humility, deep reverence, total honor. It was a way of showing profound gratitude to Jesus. He had forgiven her sins. He had poured out mercy and grace on her soul. It was the least she could do to pour out perfume on Jesus' feet. Uh Uh-oh. There is a sinner in a Pharisee's house. Polar opposites on the social scale. A man in the suburbs and a woman from the slums. What is going to happen next? Simon says to himself, Jesus is no prophet. He either does not know the character of this woman that he is allowing to touch him and thus lacks discernment and is no prophet, or he does know the character of this woman in which he is no prophet, Because no prophet would allow himself to be contaminated in this way. A true prophet would have pushed away the sinner. And Simon and the rest of those Pharisees have their first charge against Jesus. He lets sinners touch him. How long does this go on with this precious lady? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Fifteen minutes? We don't know. But there would have been silence in the room. The only sound heard would have been this woman weeping. The only sound you would hear is her weeping, wiping the feet of Jesus. At some point, Jesus breaks the silence and says, Simon, I have something to say. Simon replies, go ahead, teacher. Not Messiah, not Savior, not Lord, not even prophet. Just teacher. And Jesus tells the parable that you can read in verses 41 and 42. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. A denarii is a day's wage. What you earned when you worked one day was one denarii. And so you have one of these people, one of these men who owe the money lender 500 days worth of labor. That's over a year. You have another one who owes the money lender 50 days worth of labor. Not even two months. Whatever. One of them is ten times greater than the other. And the money lender forgives both. He graces both. The man generously cancels the debt for both. It is a picture of salvation. It is a picture of forgiveness and mercy that this woman has found. No matter the debt owed, both amounts were forgiven. Which one will then love the man more? And Simon begrudgingly answers. I picture Simon with his arms kind of folded like this and... He says, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Because you see, Simon has been caught by Jesus. Exposed by Jesus. 
unmasked by Jesus. It's not that she is the 500 denarii debtor and Simon is the 50 denarii debtor. No, they are both the 500 denarii debtor. Completely unable to pay. And it is only by the grace and mercy and forgiveness of the money lender that the debt is gone. But Simon cannot see that. And so turning toward the woman, but talking to Simon, Jesus says, do you see this woman? Can, can you see her? Simon, you're thinking if I were a prophet that I could see this woman. Can you see her? Can you really see her? No, he cannot. Because he cannot even see himself. He cannot even see his own sin. Simon, I entered your house and you didn't give me any water for my feet. Yet she's wet my feet with her tears. You didn't give me a kiss of greeting she's not ceased to kiss my feet you didn't anoint my head with oil she's anointed my feet with with perfume Jesus has received from this woman the very opposite of what he has received from Simon everything Simon neglected to do the woman did even better Simon saw himself as righteous but was blind to his own unrighteousness. While the woman, while he saw the woman as unrighteous, but was blind to her newfound righteousness. Simon saw himself as righteous, blind to his own unrighteousness, while he saw the woman as unrighteous, Blind to her new found righteousness. You see the greatest of sins. Is to be conscious of no sin. And the woman needed to hear her pardon. She needed assurance that her sins had been blotted out. In verse 48 when Jesus tells her. Your sins have been forgiven. Literally that word forgiven means dismissed her sins have been dismissed against her no sweeter words could she have ever heard and then verse 50 be you go in peace your faith has saved you go in peace it's be going into peace literally Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and for the first time in her life she has peace. And in verse 49 those who were reclining at the table with him begin to say for themselves say to themselves who who is this man Who even forgives sin. Those who were reclining around the table realized something. Hey. Only God can forgive sins. They are shocked. If only God can forgive sins. And Jesus is claiming to forgive sins. Wait, wait a minute. Jesus is claiming to be God. Because forgiving sins is a divine prerogative. You're not telling me Jesus is God, are you? And at best they are skeptical. And at worst they have another charge now to bring against Jesus. Every Sunday morning, I seek to give you a life point. How I want a passage of Scripture, 
the point at which I want to connect it to your life. Today I've got three. Three life points. And remember the question I asked you at the beginning of the message? Where are you in this story? Life point number one is this. Overwhelming forgiveness produces overflowing gratitude. How sorrowful are you over past sins? And how grateful are you for present forgiveness? How sorrowful are you over past sins? Have you ever over your sin? I have. And I don't say that to be prideful or whatever. I, I, I just, I, I want you to know that it's okay. In fact, it's right to shed tears over your own sin when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And He puts His finger right here in my chest. And like Nathan and David, Pepper, you are that man. And I have been brought to tears over my own sin. And then how grateful are you for present forgiveness? Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't push away sinners? And so we live grateful lives. Grateful for Jesus' forgiveness and mercy and grace. We live with a grateful heart that issues out into actions that are, that are grateful. Now, I just got to be honest with you. I ask you, where are you in this story? And most of us here today would probably identify with this woman. But what i got to be honest with you about is, I don't know if, I, if as a guy I'm kissing Jesus' feet. I don't know if, if as a guy I, I can relate to the woman's expression of thankfulness. Now, you ladies in the congregation this morning, you may say, "Man, yes, man, if I that that's me. I mean, I'm at the feet of Jesus, and I'm pouring oil on His feet, and 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 I'm kissing His feet, and I'm wiping them with my hair. I mean, that's that's me." But I see some fellas in here that I don't honestly, I don't see that as you or me. And so, men, listen to me for just a moment. Listen to me, men. If, 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 if you're in this story, this is you. Because you say to me, Pastor, Pastor, I'm, I'm sorrowful for my sin. And I'm grateful for present forgiveness. This, this is me. So here's, here's what you do. Here's what you do. You do what Simon should have done. Okay? You do what Simon should have done. Look, look at verse 44. And verse 44 says, Simon, I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. Now, do you know what that is? That's an act of service. Because when Jesus entered that house, his feet would have been dirty and dusty. And because he had walked the dirty streets and dusty streets of, of the city that day. And so when Simon, whether through a servant or whether himself, had taken the sandals off Jesus' feet and washed them, he was serving Jesus. Listen to me, men. Do you want to show gratitude for the fact that your sins have been forgiven? Go serve Jesus in some way. Now listen, here's what I learned years ago from Dusty at, at I'll Go Ministries from Dusty Cooper. You serve Jesus by serving others. And so guys, if you are grateful for your sin, excuse me, grateful for your forgiveness, some of you are grateful for your sin. I mean, anyway, if you're, 
Yeah. Billy Graham said, if you don't think sin's not fun, you hadn't found the right sin. <laughs> this is me not saying something that I wanted to say. <laughs> no, what I'm saying, guys, is if you are grateful for the forgiveness of sin, go serve somebody. Go serve somebody, meet a need in their life, and do it in Jesus' name. Second thing you can do is what Simon should have done when Jesus walked in the door that day. Look at verse 45. In verse 45, it says, you gave me no kiss. Now listen to me. That's a holy kiss. And you've seen this done a hundred times, probably in movies and in other places. This is how two Jewish men would greet each other. It's the little smack on the cheek, you know, this cheek and then this cheek. That's what Jesus meant. Two guys this way, this way. Okay, we don't do that in America anymore. We don't do that in, in Franklin County. We don't do that in Mount Vernon. <laughs> never, never, seen, ne- never seen two guys meet on the street. Hey, how you been? No. No, never, that's, that's not going to happen in Franklin County. But here's what we do. Here's what we do. We give them the bro hug. You know what the bro hug is. It's just a little close pat on the back. That's, that's a bro hug. Now, don't let, it, don't let it be too long. Don't linger too long now. But, but you, know, you know what the bro hug is. It's just, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Or we give them a handshake. But do you know what it's saying? It, you know what it's saying, even in our day, but especially in the first century when Jesus tells Simon, you didn't give me a kiss. Do you know what it's saying? It's saying, Jesus, you're welcome here. It says, Jesus, you are welcome in my home. Jesus, you are welcome in my life. And men, we can say that. We can say that. Jesus, you're welcome in my life and in my home. And then verse 46, Simon, Simon, you didn't, you didn't anoint my head with oil. Do you know what that meant? To place oil on the head meant Lord and Messiah. Do you see the word Messiah means anointed one. Christ means anointed one. And so men, we can say that as well. We can say and confess, Jesus, you are my Lord. Overwhelming forgiveness produces overflowing gratitude. What does that look like for you? Guys, let me suggest that here's what it looks like for you. You're going to serve others in Jesus' name. You're going to welcome Him into your life and into your home. And you're going to indeed call Him Lord and Messiah. Where are you in this story? Are you the woman? And by that I mean one who simply knows that she needs forgiveness has found it, and is full of gratitude. Number two, satisfied self-righteousness results in spiritual blindness. This is Simon. Simon is not aware of the sin in his life. How aware are you of the sin in your own life? Oh, you can readily see it in the lives of others. You can see it in the life of your neighbor. You can see it in the life of the person you work with. You can see it in the life of other people. But do you see your own sin? It is possible that you are blind to your own sin. That you have a blind spot. Man, let me suggest you do something. Ask your wife. 
Do I have a blind spot when it comes to my own sin? She's got a list already made. Just waiting on you to ask her that. Maybe, ladies, you need to do the same thing. Ask your husbands. Have I got a blind spot about something in my life? Is there a blind spot? I'm missing, I'm doing something that's sinful. I'm doing something that's wrong. I can't see it. Would you help me see it? We are blind to our own sin. And when we are blind to our own sin, we can't truly see people like Jesus sees them. Simon, do you see this woman? He couldn't because of his own sin. Number three, where are you in the story? Number three, self-imposed unbelief leads to a cool skepticism. There probably is some people in the sanctuary this morning. You're not quite sure about this Jesus fella. Is he really God? Can he really forgive my sin? Let me assure you. He is, and he can. Would you ask him to do that today? Would you believe? Would you put your faith in Jesus Christ to forgive your sin? To dismiss your sin? To blot out your sin? When you ask, he will. And you can walk out of here today in peace. Maybe for the first time in your life, you'll know real peace. So where are you in this story? A forgiven sinner? A spiritually blind religious man? A skeptical doubter? All three, the answer is found in coming to Jesus. And we stand in just a moment and sing to give you an opportunity to come to Jesus. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray right now. For those that are struggling with their relationship with Jesus. They're not quite sure if they want to commit. They're not quite sure if they want to place faith and trust in. Is he really God? That's a legitimate question for them. Can he really forgive my sins? They want to know. And I pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit. That you would show them that he can and he will. And in a moment, Father, when we stand and sing and, and I appeal to them to come, I pray that they would come down an aisle and let's have a conversation about what it means to know that Jesus can forgive you. Father, I pray for your children today, for your people, women and men today, Father, who, who are struggling still with sin. Father, may, may there be a, grieve, a grief over their own sin. But Father, behind that grief, may you fill them with gratitude over the fact that their sins have been forgiven. And Father, I, I, I pray for that one today who is in with you. He does all the right things. He he does all the right deeds. He, he, he keeps all the laws. But there's no peace in his soul. 
Give him peace today, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to thank you for watching today. I trust that something you heard helped you spiritually. I pray that something that you heard in the message challenged you to be a follower of Jesus Christ, maybe for the first time, but if you already are, I pray that the challenge you received today was to walk closer to him. If you do have questions about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I would love to answer them. Please email me. My email address is pepper at fbcmv.com. If you would like more information about First Baptist Church, Mount Vernon, you can go to our website. It's fbcmv.com. You have a great day today. And again, thanks for watching.